Observing the Planet, The Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free, it was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid the child to pray. Well, good morning, America. Good morning to Connecting the Dot listeners. And we are on a Tuesday, January 22nd. We have a terrific program lined up. It is extremely timely because we are battling over the so-called border wall. And uh, President Trump is trying to reinstitute uh, a level of national security that's reasonable, and uh, frankly, he's he's against a pile of globalists that are determined to destroy our national sovereignty and destroy our ability to protect our borders. And they are doing a terrific job at this point of doing exactly that. So we need to. Uh, discuss today what we are, what the president is trying to do with the Congress and why it's so important that the American people back up the president and get involved and be part of the solution instead of continuing to be part of the problem. Uh, today I have two guests on our radio program. I have uh, Chuck Floyd, who is a, a returning person who is a, a friend of Connecting the Dots. He's been with us a number of times in the past. He is a national security expert. He is literally uh, the architect or one of the uh, primary architects of border security. He worked uh, in the State Department. He was part of the embassy uh, architecture for embassy security internationally, and that was uh, under the Bush administration. And he has been very, very actively involved in the design of a, uh, well, it's really a multi, uh, I don't know the best term for it, I guess a multifaceted uh, border security system, which includes in any number of different things, not just a wall, but a complex of security uh, personnel and uh, procedures that have been adapted by the military uh, and have been used worldwide for security purposes. And this is a, ter- a terrific program, and uh, we do have... Incidentally, on our website, uh, for our announcement for the program, we have uh, places where you can click on the information on that site, and you will be able to read uh, Chuck's full report on border security and how uh, multifaceted border security works. So uh, with that, uh, Chuck, welcome to the radio program. And uh, it's always good to have you back on. Um, I think you, more than just about anybody I know, really understand that this is a battle for the survival of our nation. And it's a battle between people who believe in America as a sovereign nation and those who, the progressive socialists who believe in a new world order and a system of world government with no borders. Uh, absolutely. I'm uh, 
very pleased to be back on the show today to talk about the wall and what a layered security solution really looks like. And uh, also today, we're joined by Michael Cutler, who is a tremendous asset to this cause, and he's been very involved for a number of years and uh, has, you know, was a employee of the INS or ICE um, years ago. Is, is Michael on? Chuck, I, I am not sure, but it doesn't sound like Mike is uh, on the call yet. Um, okay. If there's a way that we can text him, I would appreciate it if you would and see if we can get him on that uh, on that other line. I, I didn't introduce Michael yet because I wanted to wait okay. until he was on the call. But sure. uh, Michael has been border. Uh, he's been involved with the INS and border security literally since he. Uh, graduated from uh, college, and he's been involved in the whole process really since 1971. So he knows exactly how the uh, the uh, border security works, and he would be a great man to uh, to be part of this discussion. And I hope we can get him get him on the call because uh, he would be a hands-on guy that has literally lived the process better than just about anybody in the country and has his own radio program and is very dedicated and involved in border security. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I, I would just like to say that, uh, uh, you know, today uh, Senator Mitch McConnell has the ability to be a hero for both the left and the right. In the past, uh, Senator McConnell has not, and I repeat, has not supported President Trump on his border wall and his security programs. Uh, in the last budget, the Senate put in legislation that the President could not use any of these six selected concrete wall prototypes that were vetted uh, in in California. And so this has been a real bone of contention with many conservatives, myself, and others who understand border security. And, you know, now is uh, Senator McConnell's day to shine if he wants to. You know, the Democrats in the past have played hardball on the border security because they continually get uh, illegals into the country, then through the sanctuary cities, they give them driver's license, then they register to vote. And you look at what California has become since Ronald Reagan. And so California is lost to the nation due to illegal immigration. And Republicans have been playing softball on this issue. They always say, okay, well, let's do the deal, and then we'll talk about it later. Well, later never comes. This was planned by Senator Kennedy many, many years ago and is, is really uh, instituted with Senator Schumer because uh, they don't want to give in on this. And so now the Republicans have a fighter in the White House. We have somebody who will do something about it. Presidents in the past have not. And so we need to support President Trump on this. And again, the Democrats look at this as the launch pad for 2020. And so it's really not about security of our nation. It's not about our laws, our sovereignty. It's about 2020, what they can do damage to President Trump so that the American people don't support him in 2020. And so, you know, we can, you know, what I like to do is talk about the congressional shutdown and, you know, what I think should happen. Uh, do you have any comments? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, yes, I, I, I see this whole process literally and it's been that way the entire Trump presidency as a battle between global socialists who and, and they, they make up a large part of our government an absolutely much larger portion than I had any imagined uh, had ever imagined uh, and it is uh, what's known as the deep state but it's also a large part of Congress and the Senate and um, what what these people are intending to do is destroy national sovereignty worldwide and create a one-world socialist government that's controlled 
by a handful of UN plutocrats and uh, big money people. And um, I, all I can say is that uh, President Trump has proven himself to be a hero of the American people because he actually believes in the America of our founding fathers. He understands that without capitalism and, and free markets and the ability of individuals to make decisions for themselves, we will be living in a world that will be much less much lower standard of living, much uh, less freedom, much more control, and it will be something that most Americans have no idea just exactly how despotic this system will be. And there are a lot of people that uh, at the top of our government and in leadership uh, and in big, uh, big financial business interests that are 100% in favor of this one world government because they think they'll be in control. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you look at the media in cahoots with the Democrat Party. You look at an example of the students that were in D.C. for the pro-life march and they got attacked by this black group and then this so-called Native American, you know, uh, targeted them and made them look bad when the truth finally came out. You look at the Mueller probe, you know, how that was created. Uh, it was all created prior to the election with a plan by the Democrats, by Comey and many others, where they wanted an insurance policy because they didn't want Trump in. Because, you know, President Trump has been the only president that, in my memory, during my lifetime, that has said what he wanted to do on his campaign trail and he has performed when he got into the White House. Most of the time, he gets candidates who promise you the world, and they never even commit to 10% of what they promised. Right, absolutely. And, and not only uh, do, they, do they lie to the American people, but uh, what I see happening... In our government at the top levels, uh, with the exception of, you know, what I, I see as the uh, Trump presidency, uh, there are literally, they are lining up to commit treason. And I cannot imagine how people can stand there and swear an oath to office to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and turn right around and do the exact opposite. I mean, uh, Chuck, this is open treason, and they don't even try to hide it. Yeah, that, that, that is true. I mean, you know, you, you look at our national sovereignty, our, our history, you know, a lot of these illegal aliens that come into our country, they don't even want to be part of America. They want to have their own little country inside of America. That's why the Democrats do individual uh, uh, identification in all these different groups. And so I, I wrote an article to uh, a newspaper recently, and I said, you know, what should happen to Congress with the shutdown? The members of Congress do not do the one job they're elected to do and supposed to do, which is fund the U.S. government to protect America. They should not receive their paychecks. They are not taking responsibility for their actions and their sworn oath to uphold and protect America. In addition, in my opinion, each member of Congress should be fined a thousand dollars a day for every day the government is closed. You know, this will, you know, hopefully force the politicians to take responsibility for the actions, and in this case, they're non-actions. You know, it's about time that members of Congress be accountable to the American taxpayer and do what is best for the nation, not themselves. You know, right now we have over 24 million illegals in the U.S. and 2,000 are being, uh, are arriving on our border every day. That's why CDP and DHS has such a tremendous crisis on their hands. You know, if you look at all the borders around the world, our southern border is one of the most dangerous borders in the world. We have the drugs coming across. We have the cartels. They have more firepower 
and uh, the CBP. And, you know, I, I've been involved uh, with this for a number of years. I, you know, was on the border. I helped the Minutemen uh, project. You know, we were down there in 2004, 5, 6, 7. I've been down there every year, uh, you know, looking at uh, new technologies to protect the border. I've been shot at by the Mexicans coming across. The CDP is being shot at every day by the drug cartel. They have their fighters, their, uh, their uh, people that just manage uh, the smuggling of people and drugs coming across the border. You know, the illegal immigration for the United States, you go back to 1999, it was $180 billion in 1999. It's well over $200 billion a year right now between the, the courts, the schools, the hospitals, all the other fraud on the American people with identity theft, all the other things that go on. And so $30 billion for a wall, that would, you know, the ROI, return on investment, would be a month and a half. And you look at the billions of dollars that are remitted back into Central and South America every year, if we could put a stop to that, those jobs would dry up and they would go home. So there are lots of things that we need to do. And again, we can talk about border security because I, I, I've talked to a lot of people who do not understand what President Trump is talking about. When he says a wall, they go, oh, well, I really don't want a wall. Well, they don't understand layer security. So I'd like to get into that in a couple of minutes. I uh, just wanted to find out if you had any more comments. Well, uh, Chuck, I, I have to say that the uh, the cost, I mean, the, the Democrats uh, and the progressives are talking about how this is going to cost so much and this is, uh, you know, a, a, a deal breaker and a budget breaker and all that, yet they know full well that illegal immigration between the drugs, between uh, the uh, the crime, between that and all the welfare and uh, miscellaneous programs that uh, cost the American taxpayers that illegal immigration and drug smuggling and human trafficking uh, into the United States by most estimates is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, the latest estimate I saw was a half a trillion dollars a year in cost to our society between uh, the drugs and all the other, uh, all the other parts of this puzzle. And, uh, if, if a, uh, uh, five billion dollar deal is a deal breaker, then why do we send over ten billion dollars to Mexico to deal with? And to deal with all these things as part of a, uh, foreign aid package. Why don't we just take care of our own? That, that is true. Uh, just last year, uh, the, the, the State Department issued an RFP, a request for proposal, uh, in the United States for a, a, an American company to provide the software and the hardware to every court in Mexico. Why did we do that? <laughs> yeah. I mean... You look at the amount of money that we give out at USAID, State Department, DOD, it's hundreds of billions of dollars that we give out, and we get nothing in return. And so President Trump has been on this, you know, from NATO to the State Department, USAID, and other agencies. He said, what's the return on investment on everything that we're sending? And if these countries do not want to support us, then we should not be helping them. You know, if you look at Mexico, I mean, there are so many uh, USAID and State Department grants and, RF and programs that we support them on, but why? Because they're doing nothing to help us. You look at, you know, these caravans that are coming through Mexico, they just let them come, they just let them walk right in and come to our border. And then the Mexican people in Tijuana and other places are sick of it because they, you know, the caravans, you know, they bring medical issues. They don't have any food and water and, and, uh, you know, the environmental issues. So there are tons of issues that 
these caravans and these individuals bring to our border every day. And without a physical barrier, we will never be able to control the border. The physical barrier is just one part of a layered security solution. And what you want to do is have the barriers with the layered security solution so you force the individuals that are trying to come into our country into the ports of entry. That's the key. And so the Democrats have been saying, oh, well, we're not going to do anything but the ports of entry. Well, you know, the ports of entry we have had pretty good control of, uh, even though under uh, President uh, Bush and then Obama, uh, they, let, uh, they, they let Mexican truck drivers bring product into the U.S. and then drive it all over the U.S. before they had to come into the U.S., drop it, and then American uh, truck drivers would take it from that location to wherever it went in, in the U.S. And so by allowing the Mexican truck drivers to drive it from the place of origin to the place of destination, that creates a, a key issue where we do not have full inspection on all the cargo that comes through until you have lots of drugs coming through the ports of entry uh, due to this one issue. Right, and, and um, you know, uh, the, the thing that we always hear is that this is not right. We're a nation of immigrants. This is, uh, this is all about immigration, and, you know, this is wrong that we're closing the borders. This is nonsense because we still have legal immigration. All we're trying to do is stop all of the the things that are illegal that are part of the immigration. I mean, the human trafficking, the uh, drug smuggling, all the stuff that's coming through here because of the the uh, Mexican drug cartels and all the different groups that are profiting from illegal immigration. This is what we're trying to stop. This has nothing to do with people who want to come here legally. I know a number of people who have come here legally as immigrants and are contributing uh, tremendously to our society. And uh, that's not, you know, the whole point is stopping all the illegal traffic, all the illegal drugs, all the illegal things that are going on. And the Democrats just don't want to address that. That, that is true. Even uh, for the legal immigration system, we accept a million people a year just through the legal immigration system. Just imagine that. No other country in the world has anything close to that. To me, you know, we should be accepting maybe 100,000 a year. I mean... Because you know, a million people a year, you know, will not be able to assimilate into our society and do the things that they're supposed to be doing. And again, a lot of this comes from chain migration. So, uh, first off, you know, let's talk about the border because a wall is a wall, but there are many other aspects. And so, the, the layered border security plan that I've laid out uh, many times from uh, for President Trump, Trump and President Bush before. Has, has to do with a fiscal barrier, which is a wall, a uh, fence, or some kind of fiscal barrier that will stop a person from just walking into our nation. If you go back many years ago, uh, Duncan Hunter, Congressman Hunter, did this from uh, in San Diego. They had unused uh, metal slats from Vietnam where airplanes used to land on, and they put those up, and that helped. So. When you do a layered border security program, the fiscal wall is only one part. Then you put up the sensors. Uh, you have uh, sensors to detect people walking toward the wall. You have people, you have sensors that are on the fence itself, which is called a touch fence. The Israelis use it. Then you also have uh, cameras sitting in the background. You have Constantina wire. You have a road in between so you can see if anybody gets over it, their tracks. And then you have another fence. So there's a multitude of different technologies in a layered security fence program that, that are very effective. 
in uh, right now we use UAVs. Uh, we use all kinds of different things in order to make sure that people don't come into the country illegally. And so this has to go across the entire border, and then the ports of entry have to have the manpower in order to control the number of people, number of vehicles, number of railroad cars, of products being made in, in Mexico coming into our nation. So this is just one part. The other part has to do with legislation. And this is where Congress really has to step up to the plate. You have to have mandatory be verified. You have to stop chain migration. You, you know, you have to look at the birthright citizenship of these legals. They just come in, they have babies, and all of a sudden, hey, the baby's here, so now they've got to stay here instead of go back to their own country. You look at the number of uh, individuals that come in and are coached on how to ask for asylum. Right now, it's almost a million cases backlog in the court system. You know, so this is part of what President Trump is asking. He needs more legal teams on the border so when somebody comes in, we have enough space in order to uh, hold them and then try them, and 90% of the cases are not uh, upheld. And so they should be reported back into Mexico as soon as possible. And so the catch and release has to end. It's still going on today because the federal courts have been involved and, and for example, on kids, if they held more than 20 days, which, again, the court system is overburdened and it takes years and years for them to get through the court case, then they're released. And so where do they go? They go to other illegals and others that are in the country, uh, family members. You look at the caravans and the newspaper reporters have been asking them, don't you know when you get to the border that you will be stopped? They go, hey, we don't care. We know that we're going to get to the border. We know we can cross illegally to the United States. And guess what? We have family members from Central and South America that are already in the United States, and so we're going to go live with them. So this is a huge problem. No other country in the world has immigration policies like we do. If we just take Mexico's immigration policy and put that into the United States, our problems would be solved. Oh, absolutely, and I, you know, we, you mentioned the, uh, the caravan, and uh, I think our listeners, I don't know if uh, all of them know, I think uh, quite a few of them understand that uh, these caravans are being financed, and transportation uh, is being provided by people like George Soros. I mean, they, they literally are uh, funding illegal immigration into the country and it's the same people who believe in one world socialist government uh, and they've been promoting it openly I mean if there is an enemy of the United States of our great republic it certainly is people like George Soros and um, I think it's high time to not only recognize these people for what they are doing but uh, fight back against these people. Yeah, a a absolutely. And, you know, you look at the media and everybody else and that they are against President Trump and the uh, average American citizen that wants this to be solved. And so you look at under President Obama, George Soros even got money from the State Department for a contract where he was going into Eastern Europe and challenging the Democratic uh, society in Eastern Europe. And so Absolutely. Chuck, I, I hate to uh, stop you on the break, but uh, let's pick this up on the other side of the break. Okay, no problem. Serving the planet, the micro effect. www.themicroeffect.com Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel, and today we are talking about border security and why we need border security. 
and why without border security we will lose our national sovereignty and we will lose our ability to protect the American people. And it's incredibly important that people understand that we are in literally a battle of life and death for the future of our nation if we cannot protect our borders, if we cannot provide any basic national security by maintaining borders, we will not have a nation. And uh, it's important that people understand just exactly how insidious this whole process is. So uh, with that, Chuck, uh, you were talking about George Soros and how uh, George Soros had actually received money through grant programs to do things that were very anti-American. And I'm very familiar with that whole program. He literally uh, received many, many hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, grant aid to uh, promote some of his very socialist, anti-American programs. Yes, absolutely. And then also, under President Obama, through the State Department, they had another grant where a company went into Israel and tried to derail Benjamin Netanyahu. And so... You know, the Democrats, you don't hear anything about that, but you hear all about Russia, 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 which there's no collusion or proof other than what the Democrats and Hillary Clinton did, yet they don't want to even go there or even have that investigated. A couple of items that the Democrats don't want to talk about on border security is, one, assault on women and children. I've been down on the border where I've seen where they have layup areas and in the layup area, in the, they have uh, trees around there, and they have women's panties and bras and other stuff grown up in the tree, and they call that a rape tree. And so when they get to a certain point coming across the border, the illegals change into other clothes, and then they just dump everything, plastic water bottles, all kinds of stuff. And there is a tremendous environmental issue all across the border where the illegals come across. One of the areas that I've been in is the Goldwater Air Force Range, and, you know, they have taxes that are, you know, from 6 to 10 feet tall. I mean, it's, it's a national historic monument area, and the drug cartels drive across there with drugs and people and everything else every day, and they destroy our environment all across the border. Same thing with the Rio Grande. But the Democrats never want to talk about these issues because this derails what they want to do. Yes, ab- absolutely. And and I, I have to say when we're talking about this, Chuck, we're also talking about uh, the progressives in the Republican Party. I don't want to... I don't want to uh, ignore the fact that part of the problem that President Trump is facing is that we have a number of progressive socialists within the Republican Party who are part of the so-called establishment party, uh, who are part of the same resistance group that uh, collude with many of the progressive Democrats to try to end a lot of his programs that put America first. And uh, uh, I, uh, Chuck, it sounds like uh, Michael Cutler has joined us on this uh, on this program. Uh, I want to uh, uh, do another little bit of a lead-in uh, on Michael, but uh, Michael has been involved with the INS with uh, the whole program of immigration and illegal immigration as well as legal immigration. Uh, since 1971, and Michael has his own radio program uh, that we'll be talking about a little later in our broadcast, but uh, he is really concerned about what has been happening in this country because of all the illegal immigration, and this is a guy who has been boots on the ground, uh, part of the whole program for, what, uh, almost... uh, Almost 50 years, 40, 48 years, long time. Anyway, uh, Michael, welcome to the program, and please tell our listeners a little bit about your background. 
Sure. Thanks for having me, Dan. Uh, I'm a retired senior special agent with what used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Service. You're right. I started. At, it's, it's painful to think about how long ago, 1971, uh, I began my career as an immigration inspector assigned to Kennedy International Airport. Uh, you know, I described that four years since as an inspector when I assisted Jan Brewer, the governor of Arizona, when, if you recall, she was outrageously sued by the DOJ under the Obama administration for Arizona's immigration law, SB 1070, which really simply paralleled federal immigration law. And I described that first four-year period as the time that I had my eye to the people on America's front door, because that's really what we're talking about. Uh, you know, our immigration laws are completely blind about race, religion, ethnicity. It's nothing like that. It's about keeping up people who have dangerous diseases, who are criminals, spies, terrorists, fugitives from justice, and aliens who would take the jobs of Americans. It's very straightforward and common sense. In uh, 1973, way back when, I spent a year doing the marriage interviews looking to find fraud where people were getting married to get green cards but not living together. Um, we were able to uncover marriage fraud rings being run by immigration lawyers. The case that I worked on uh, involved an attorney who was arranging, if you can believe this, marriages between Chinese crewmen who jumped ship and Puerto Rican lesbian hookers in New York City. Only in New York can you, can you have something like that, I guess. In 1975, I became a special agent. My very first fraud investigation in 1976 led me to uncover a terror plot in Israel whereby the Israelis were able to prevent the bombing of an oil refinery. Uh, I rotated through all the squads within the investigations branch. In 1988, I became the first immigration agent assigned to the Unified Intelligence Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration. In 1997, May 20th, I said, before that actually, in uh, 2000, uh, 1991, I was promoted to senior special agent and assigned to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. So I had desks at the FBI, DEA, ATF, worked with local and city uh, police agencies, worked with foreign governments, including Israel, Canada, Great Britain, got an award from the government of Japan. So it gave me truly a global perspective on the immigration issue. In 1997, May 20th, I testified before my first congressional hearing. <clears throat> it was a hearing called because of two terror attacks in 1993 involving men from the Middle East. First, the shooting at the CIA by a Pakistani by the name of Kansi, who shot up the CIA, killed two CIA officers, wounded three others, fled the country, was brought back, put on trial, found guilty, and executed. But it didn't change the tragedy that he created. Uh, 1990, uh, February 1993, of course, we had the first bombing at the World Trade Center that killed six, injured over a thousand, and almost toppled the tower. Over a half billion dollars in damages were inflicted. So there was a hearing held, and what it explored was the nexus between immigration fraud, visa fraud, and terrorism. Nothing was done by the Clinton administration to address those vulnerabilities. In fact, in 1996, they implemented a program, they, the Clinton administration, called CUSA, Citizenship USA, whereby they ran 1.1 million applications for U.S. citizenship through the system so quickly that many of the applications were approved before criminal histories came back based on fingerprints, and it turned out that we had naturalized thousands of aliens who should have been deported. We had the attack, of course, on 9-11. I had been sidelined by an injury. I hurt my leg executing arrest and search warrants at the FBI and the New York City Police Department. But uh, because I had been before Congress when the attacks occurred, um, my phone rang off the hook. I went down from Washington to meet with Congressman Pam Tancredo. I agreed to testify before the Immigration Reform Caucus in November. The next day I was told that because of my leg injury, I was being removed as an agent. Interesting timing. Um, I fought back. And uh, then, if you remember, Dan, um, in, uh, I guess it was February, or I'm sorry, March of 1990, uh, of 2002, uh, it was discovered to everyone's horror that two of the dead terrorists, Mohammed Atta, the ringleader, and another one, Marwan al Shahi, had been granted permission to go to flight school, of all things. So this is six months after the attack. Everyone knows they were terrorists, everyone knows they're dead, but immigration screws up, and they give them permission to attend flight school. I was one of the four uh, witnesses called to that hearing that was conducted by the House Judiciary Committee. 
And then we had the uh, construction of DHS, what I call the Department of Homeland Surrender by George W. Bush, another globalist. Uh, what they did with immigration was to slice it into multiple components and fold it in with multiple other agencies. Let's remember that ICE is an acronym for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Customs has absolutely less than nothing to do with immigration. Prior to the creation of DHS, Customs was under the Treasury Department. Immigration was under the Justice Department. Customs is about keeping contraband out of the United States and collecting duties and tariffs, period. Has nothing whatsoever to do with people, immigration, passports, nothing. And it was apparent to everybody that this was done to make it impossible for immigration to carry out its mission. And in fact, I testified, um, I think altogether now, 17 times before House and Senate committees and subcommittees. I was at a hearing with John Hostetler. He was the chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee, a Republican, who, when he described the way that DHS had been created, stated unequivocally that what the administration, that is to say the Bush administration, had created was immigration chaos, immigration, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, it became impossible to, to get the job done, leaving us vulnerable. The push for globalism is on both sides of the aisle. And look, let's face it, Ronald Reagan gave us the visa waiver program. Uh, by the way, that should have ended, you would think, after 9-11. On 9-11, 26 countries participated in the, in the visa waiver program. Today, there are 38 countries on the list. Ronald Reagan gave us the first amnesty program, and what most people don't know, and you wouldn't know if you were outside the agency, is that it also included a confidentiality provision. Now, this is how insidious this is. Normally, I'm sitting at the FBI, if an FBI agent came up to me and said, Mike, we're looking for this guy, he's killed four people, we're afraid he's going to kill somebody else, what do you have on him? I would immediately turn over my immigration file and say, here you go. <clears throat> they would sign a freedom of information notice that they had reviewed the file. All that I could not share with them is third agency material. But anything that immigration generated, I was able to hand over and help them find the guy before he does more damage. The uh, information contained in amnesty files were off limits to everybody but immigration agents. So if I turned over a photograph or an address or the name of a, of a family member of the target of an investigation to any law enforcement agency for any reason, I would have been committing a five-year felony. Both sides of the aisle because of the desire for cheap, exploitable labor and a host of other issues have been eager to take down our borders. When I testified before a hearing before the House Judiciary Committee, an individual who was involved with the Chamber of Commerce, I call them the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, rather, they, they, the Chamber of Commerce, the guy came up to me at a recess that the members of Congress had to go vote, and he said, Mr. Cutler, you need to stop pushing for border security. That border is an impediment to my wealth. I said, that border is our first and last line of defense. He said, I don't care what it is, your arguments are costing us lots of money. I said, who's us? I mean, this is what we're facing, and finally, what the immigration system does is provide an unlimited supply of cheap, exploitable, of, the, of, the, of the cheap those clients for the lawyers. Because understand that one of the provisions of comprehensive immigration reform would have required the government to pay for the attorneys for the illegal aliens because lawyers don't like to work for free. And you have immigration attorneys on both sides of the aisle. You know, Bob Goodlatte just stepped down from Congress. He's a Republican. He was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, very powerful here, uh, committee that oversees, among other things, immigration, the FBI, the courts, and so forth. Goodlatte is an immigration lawyer. Before he came to Congress, he had a highly successful multi-state H-1B visa practice. And during his time in Congress, he kept pushing for more H-1B visas. And both parties have said, we can support 11 million illegals, and if you look at the studies by Harvard and Yale, they believe that the number could be doubled or tripled, That I think it's probably well over 30 million by now. So the argument is, if we can't support them all, the best we can do is get them out of the shadows and give them legal status. So then the debate, and this is a bait and switch, goes from the Democrats who say, we want to give them a pathway to citizenship, 
and the Republicans say, oh no, we're tough. We're not going to make this an amnesty. They're not getting a pathway to citizenship. It is an amnesty whether or not they give them a pathway to citizenship because they came to work. And if you give them legal status with or without a pathway to citizenship, they're able to work and send hundreds of billions of dollars out of our economy. The wall, for example, would pay for itself because of the money we lose by illegal aliens working in America. And they're not just coming, by the way, across the Mexican border. They're coming across the northern border. They're stowing away on ships. And about half of them are entering through international airports with visas or under the visa waiver program and then violating the terms of their admission. So we're being flooded by cheap foreign labor, which is driving down wages, displacing American workers, negatively impact national security and patent rights and intellectual property rights. And all this for the short-term benefits to be gained by having cheaper workers come to America. So again, the problem isn't the Democrats or the Republicans, it's both. And, and so when, when you hear this false argument, whether or not we should give them citizenship, we don't get that argument from any other area of law enforcement. I want everyone to think about that. You have more people with cell phones and driver's licenses than we have illegal aliens in the United States, no matter what that terrible number is. You will never hear a governor, a mayor, or a chief of police say, there are so many people with phones and licenses, we can't do anything about it. Where immigration is concerned, you always hear that. When you talk about building a wall, what do they say? Well, if you put up a 30-foot wall, they're going to come with a 35-foot ladder. Sure, that's true. But it's not about stopping everybody. It's about cutting the numbers down to manageable levels where the Border Patrol can deal with them. Now the Democrats want drones on the border. Well, the GAO has found that the drones are ineffective, almost worthless. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars, which please the contractors who get those great contracts. But the GAO in one study said that drones have been involved with fewer than one half of one percent of all Border Patrol arrests. And when you think about it, a drone and the sensors on the ground are like a burglar alarm. They let you know after the break-in occurred. A border wall would help to prevent the break-in in the first place. To not have a border wall and sensors and drones is the equivalent of putting a sophisticated alarm system in a house, but the house has no front door. Because the border wall, in essence, is a front door, and it wouldn't stop anybody from coming in. It would simply funnel everybody and all cargo into a port of entry where they could be uh, inspected as the law requires. In fact, that was the point they just made on Fox and Friends first uh, this morning. I was up at Ogar 30 to do yet another interview for Fox. Trying to get the American people to understand the issues is very difficult. Fox is willing to have that conversation. NRA TV is willing to do it. One American News Network, they're willing to have the conversation. Where are the other networks? in La La Land because they're working in cahoots with the globalists. How's that for a quick overview, Dan? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, uh, you reinforce what I believe. There are a lot of people that have worked and are working in our government that aren't part of the New World Order and understand just exactly how insidious this whole plan for global governance and and uh, let's say no national sovereignty. And certainly, uh, Michael, what you're referring to shows the total lack of regard for our constitutional republican form of government. Uh, the, these people uh, believe in a whole different system and the fact that we've had so many people at so many different levels of government in our leadership who have acquiesced to this uh, one world, uh, new world order nonsense uh, shows just exactly how deep-seated the communists and the socialists are in our national discussion. Well, it's a level of greed we've never seen before. And, you know, when the Supreme Court decided Citizens United, essentially the gloves came off and it basically opened the floodgates to, to, to corrupting money and influence. Uh, you know, let's call campaign contributions what they are. They're bribes. Plain and simple. As a federal agent, I was not allowed to accept anything more than a glass of ice water. We were under strict orders. You know, if you knocked on some guy's door, 
because the guy living five doors down from him was the target of an investigation. Very often you would try to get neighbors to help you by telling you what's going on and can they recognize photographs and that sort of thing. And very often people would be very accommodating. You'd knock on the door and they'd say, hey, we're just having coffee, why don't you join us? We were under strict instructions and we always ab abided by them that the most you could accept is ice water, not even a cup of coffee. The idea to hold the public at arm's length and to not any, have anyone think that a fe the federal agent on duty is somehow their friend. You had to maintain professional uh, insulation, if you will, from the public. And you have the politicians. How many emails do you folks get asking for money? We're running the campaign. The other side is after us. Send money. Imagine if police officers and members of the armed forces and law enforcement were, were, were operating that way. You know, if you do it as a civil servant, it's called graft, it's called corruption. When the politicians do it, it's called the campaign contribution. Uh, you know, I, I've jokingly said that now what we need is a new position in, uh, at the cabinet level, perhaps, the, offic the official auctioneer. You know, maybe they can get the guy from the Mecham Auto Auction because I think he does a really great job. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to tell you, I uh, am very pleased to hear uh, your attitude about this. I, uh, I When I have a new guest on my radio show, I'm always uh, a, a little bit concerned that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be, uh, let's say, an inside job, and I'll end up with someone that's promoting what we're trying to uh trying to talk about as being a bad a bad thing and you certainly don't fit that bill at all uh michael it's a pleasure to have you here uh i want to get chuck back into the conversation i know you guys are great friends uh uh chuck has nothing but uh great things to say about you michael and uh i i i know that uh chuck has been involved in uh doing the layered security plan for the uh, for, for the president, for actually for President uh, Bush as well as President Trump, how have you two gentlemen worked together to uh, let's say make this plan a stronger, better plan? Uh, this is Chuck. Uh, first off, I'd like to just uh, comment about Michael's uh, uh, some of the items he talked about. I have been at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on many meetings on border security, immigration, and all those issues, and that is the only time that I see the Chamber of Commerce, unions, and other globalists agree on one issue, open borders. I would raise my hand and I would ask questions that would embarrass them, and uh, you know, of course, Donna Hughes in charge of the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they don't want it. They don't want border security. They want cheap labor. And so you have one group that wants cheap labor on one hand and another group that wants votes on the other hand. And so this is not in the national interest. And so everything Michael said is absolutely true. And so on, on the layered border security program, you know, in, in my past as a member of the U.S. Army, I was deputy commander of uh, the U.S. Battalion on the what we call the MFO, the Multinational Force and Observers, peacekeeping unit in the Sinai Desert uh, between Egypt and Israel. There we had 11 different nations come in, we, we observed what was going on, we reported things so that uh, we kept the security and then uh, it also as in the military I've been to Korea, been to the DMZ, had seen that. I've been in probably 60 different countries so I know what border security is and what it looks like. And so on our southern border we're going to have to have president trump finally take a step forward and issue a national security emergency and the military is really going to have to get involved because many as she said dhs cdp and other agencies really don't want a total security program on the southern border but i think we're going to have to get the military involved and get a combination of an mfo where you do observation and people like the DMZ where you have the, the enforcement uh, there. And so you're going to have to have a combination of a military force like this on our southern border. And we would 
uh, court asked Mexico to to, to their side of the border, but that they would do since they let all the Caribbean into the country and they didn't have a free range. But we're going to have to have the military involved in order to really get border security. And if you go back okay. and look at... Chuck, I uh, I hate to stop you, uh, but uh, we've got a break coming up. But let's pick sure. this up on the other side of the break. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Serving the planet, the micro effect. www.themicroeffect.com. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free, it was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate, and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid the child to pray. Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel, and today I have two very special guests on our radio show. We are discussing national security at the highest level. We are talking about the plan to, and this is a globalist plan, a plan to destroy our national sovereignty by eliminating uh, legitimate borders and border security and how President Trump is doing everything in his power to try to make America first by creating national security, border security that makes sense for America and provides a level of security that we need as a nation. Um, my guests today are Chuck Floyd and Michael Cutler, and we are having a terrific discussion about how national border security is a high, if not the highest priority that we have right now. It's certainly at the very, very top of the list. And uh, how important it is that we support the president in his search to try to uh, create a, a national security that works for America. Uh, Chuck, you were uh, partway through your thought. I'm sorry I had to uh, stop you for the break, but uh, go ahead and continue your thoughts. Sure. Uh, you know, Mike, Michael brings the civilian police mentality to the issue. I bring the military uh, mentality to this issue. And so I, I look at what we've done in the military in the past. We've used HEPCO products uh, in combat areas like Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places in the world where we can put in uh, very high border security, vehicle security, with very low cost, and it can, you know, and you can do a mile in hours of border security by using HESCO products. And so the paper that I sent to you, which you have on your website, has a, a layer security program using HESCO products. For $5 billion, the HESCO products can, can, can secure the entire border because you don't need concrete. You just put it up and use locks and dirt and other stuff in the, in the items. And so if people would go to that uh, website and take a look at the plan, they would see how it could be put up very easily, especially in the Rio Grande area where you, and, and other areas that have difficult terrain. So, again, what Michael said is that you have to channel the people into the ports of entry. That's what the military does. They use channeling for military operations. 
And so you would use these products, natural barriers and others, in order to channel people into the right areas so that the CBP can do the job of looking at the vehicles, the trucks, the people, all the other things that are coming into the United States. So that, that, that's what I would like to see, and I think you know, it, it can be, you know, concrete, steel, whatever. I've been on the peacekeeping force in, in the Middle East. I've been to Israel many, many times, doing what they do. They have these very good security with their fence and their technology, and that's kind of what I think to be is my plan on, uh, and they're like 99% of the second. And so I think Michael is right on target, and I'll let him take over from here. Okay. Okay. Um, I, um, uh, Michael, I, I, we're getting a little bit of background noise. I, I would like to have you uh, come on and talk about uh, from your perspective. But uh, uh, when you're not speaking, would you uh, would you please mute your phone or uh, cover it? Because uh, we are getting a bit of my, uh, background noise from your phone. Sure. Uh, I, I apologize. Oops. I will do that. Okay. Let's talk about how the military and the civilian sector can work together on uh, this border security program well here's something that, that is almost always left out of the conversation and I think intentionally not by the guys on our side of the argument but but the other side one of the most effective things we can do for border security has nothing to do with the border And there's two quick points I want to make by the way when I was on with Neil Cavuto a number of years ago he said to me well you know we could figure out that if there's more aliens arrested it means that our security is better or worse and he was trying to use arrest statistics for anybody who doubts how bad border security is forget about immigration arrest look simply no further than the price and availability of heroin and cocaine those substances are manufactured entirely from outside the United States every gram is smuggled in the demand for heroin has never been higher. The price has never been cheaper. That flies in the face of common sense, classic economics, where demand drives the price up. The only way that you could have a super high demand and super low prices is if you have an unlimited supply of the drugs. And the only way that could happen is if you have an abject lack of border security. But, but go back to the point that I made before. We're a nation of 50 border states. Any state with an international airport is also a border state. Most of the terrorists that come through international airports. And once inside the United States, they have virtually nothing to fear from immigration law enforcement for two reasons. Number one, sanctuary cities, which are illegal, which undermine national security and public safety, make a mockery of our immigration laws, and violate the findings and recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, to which I provided testimony. The 9-11 Commission staff turned out a report called Terrorist Travel. And the first thing they said in the preface is, you know, it might be obvious, but if you can keep the terrorists from entering the United States in the first place, they can't attack us. So we come back to border security. But they also spoke about visas and interior enforcement, and which takes us back to that very first hearing that I did back in 97. The issue is that once an illegal alien is in the United States today, they have virtually nothing to fear. There are tens of millions of illegal aliens. Interior enforcement today consists of 6,000 ICE agents, and half of them are doing customs work. Remember, the C in ICE is customs. If you're really serious about interior enforcement, you don't have 3,000 agents for the whole country. I'm a New Yorker. On 9-11, those ashes from ground zero landed on my home. My neighbors died. I can't even tell you what that day was like. I think anybody who was here was still suffering from post-traumatic stress and rage, I will tell you. But on, on New Year's Eve, there were 6,000 New York City police officers just to protect Times Square, a 10-block area or a 15-block area, 6,000 police officers with drones and helicopters. We have half that number working 24-7 from coast to coast, border to border, and, along, and inside U.S. possessions to not only arrest illegal aliens, people don't realize this, but to investigate immigration fraud. Look at the Tsarnaev brothers who were granted political asylum, claiming credible fear we can't go back to Russia. Of course, they went back to Russia. Clearly, they lied, but it was the tactic that enabled them to embed themselves in, in Boston. 
or at least in that part of the country. We've seen it time and again. The 19 hijackers on 9-11 used 364 false names or false aliases and variations of false names. Many of them had been granted political asylum, amnesty, that sort of thing. Without an adequate number of immigration agents, all of those crimes that create vulnerabilities for the terrorists to expose them go away because there's no one to check. And then we're, we're handed the lie, well, if only we had mandatory E-Verify, illegal aliens couldn't get a job. That's one of the most naive and ridiculous statements I've heard in a very long time, but think of how many people believe the nonsense. People who intentionally hire illegal aliens almost always hire them off the books. If they're off the books, they are invisible to the immigration system unless you have immigration agents who can go out and conduct investigations and audits of places that employ people. But this, again, is why they don't want interior enforcement, because then agents would find the employers who are violating the law, and they could be subject to fines, they could be subject to criminal prosecution. So you pass tough laws, you give the laws these great names that sound like, boy, oh boy, we're serious, and then you hire nobody to enforce the supposed tough laws. So one of the key issues to take the pressure off the border is a vibrant and meaningful enforcement program for within the interior of the United States. Again, that is something that is being rejected by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and by the contributors for the campaign. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this push for cheap labor started on the Republican side of the aisle. Businesses want cheap labor. That's why you see the H-1B visa program. And, and, and why do they have the H-1B visa program? Because Americans are incapable? Of course not. In fact, We've had hundreds of thousands of brilliant, experienced, talented, and well-trained American computer programmers, scientists, and technicians fired and replaced by people from India. China is an adversary of ours. They're not our ally. How in the world Herbert Walker Bush gave the most favored trade status will have me scratching my head as long as I live. China hacks our computers every second of every minute of every hour of every day. We are training their programmers in the United States. A year ago, we admitted 152,000 Chinese high-tech students, STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and math. Finally, President Trump is trying to push back, and the people on Wall Street are screaming, oh my God, this is going to hurt our quarter's profits. Again, we keep thinking short-term, how much money are we going to make this quarter, not looking at where is this taking our country five years from now. So we're educating the engineers that are building up China's military. When they're here, they're able to have practical training by working for companies to get military contracts. They take the secrets back to China. They hack our computers, and they've made it clear that they are expecting to be the dominant power in the world in less than a decade. And who's training them? We are. And who shares the technology and the training? Wonderful countries like North Korea. This whole push to take down our borders, educate foreign students, bring in cheap labor is undermining our security. It's undermining the world's security. And, you know, when I was with Mike Chertoff at Chapman Law School a few years ago, I raised an issue, and he had no answer. And I raised this issue at congressional hearings. When aliens naturalize, they become United States citizens, they're entitled to change their name. Well, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I happen to be Jewish. Many of my parents' friends and people that I grew up with came from Eastern Europe. They wanted names that were easy to pronounce and sounded American, so we allow people to get a new name. That's great. However, their U.S. passport only reflects their new name. They are putting themselves into a sort of witness protection program. We've seen terrorists from the Middle East come to America and become naturalized citizens because we don't have enough agents to do the investigations to make certain that they're not bad guys. We've had a bunch of naturalized citizens turn out to be terrorists in the United States. Again, lack of interior enforcement, and this is the damage done. But then they get a U.S. passport that only reflects their new name. So the whole world is looking for them under their old name. They show up with a new name, and guess what? They're, they have access to our allies. They have access to our airports. Those names, their original names, often are not on those fly lists. 
so so the new name gets them through border security around the world and who's giving them the new name we are and all i suggested at congressional hearings and i raised this issue with mike turtle why aren't we simply adding the original name that the alien presented when he or she entered the united states and the answer you get is oh that's a political problem how in the world is it a political problem to make certain that a travel document that's supposed to fully and accurately identify an international traveler should be able to get a document that ignores the first half of their entire adult lives? Think of how we have become our own worst enemy. Would you disagree with me on that? No, as a matter of fact, I uh, we've done a couple of... Uh couple of radio shows talking about how political correctness is dismantling our Constitution and destroying our country. Well, and the reality that. is, is that, that. Uh, uh, most Americans, even though they don't realize it, have been drinking at the, at the uh, globalist trough long enough that they're starting to think like globalists when, in fact, we ought to be thinking like Americans. Well, you know, but this isn't political correctness. That term drives me up a wall. This is Orwellian. If, if by political correctness we mean that we shouldn't be u using language that insults people or that impugns people, I agree a thousand percent with it. My kids have never heard me say the N-word or any word that smells of it. This isn't about that. This is about the elimination of thought through the elimination of words because human beings think with words. That was the reason Jimmy Carter started this nonsense with uh, demanding that immigration employees stop using the word illegal alien to describe illegal aliens. The term alien is not an insult. It simply means any person, not a citizen or national of the United States. That's not my definition. That's the definition that is found in the Immigration and Nationality Act, the overall body of immigration law that I enforced for 30 years. So why didn't they want the word alien to be used? Because if you could use the word immigrants where the word alien used to be, now we're a nation of immigrants, and if you dare suggest that we keep any foreigner out of the country, you're being anti-immigrant, so you must be a xenophobe. In fact, when I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, the late Arlen Inspector used the word exophobe to describe that position, then realized that he had made an error because I thought perhaps he was afraid of the letter X, and then he corrected himself and said xenophobe. So it's an intimidation tactic. It's a tactic of artful use of language to destroy understanding of the issues, and it comes right out of the pages of George Orwell. If you really want to have an understanding of how this works, read 1984. It would blow your mind. There's one thing I want to read, though, about international competition, and I think this really shows for what it is, uh, this goal of, of replacing American workers with foreign workers and making them compete. Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, testified for Chuck Schumer on April 30th, 2009, on the topic of comprehensive immigration reform. By the way, you should know I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Times. Then Senator Jeff Sessions liked it so much he quoted me from the floor of the U.S. Senate during the floor debate back in 2006, because in my op-ed piece I came to call comprehensive immigration reform by a new and I thought more accurate title. I called it the Terrorist Assistance and Facilitation Act because you'd be providing aliens who would enter the United States surreptitiously with lawful status, official identity documents, but with numbers so great that there would be no way to conduct interviews, let alone field investigations. This would have been a red carpet for fraud, and again, we know that immigration fraud was the key vulnerability when it can be used to further the agenda. So alien is okay in the word DREAM Act, but don't use it anywhere else, or you're going to be accused of being a terrible human being. So Greenspan talked about how bringing in foreign workers at the bottom rung of the economic ladder only minimally suppresses wages of Americans without high school diplomas. It also increases homelessness tremendously, but we don't talk about that, do we? But then he got to the high-tech workers, started to parrot what Bill Gates had told him about how we're driving away the world's best and brightest by not bringing in more H-1Bs. Of course, there's a term for the world's best and brightest. We call them Americans. When I told that to Ted Cruz, and we both spoke at an event in Washington, he got so angry he actually pushed me. I thought we were going to wind up having some kind of a physical confrontation. 
because he kept saying, we need to bring in the world's best and brightest to help America lead. And I told him, I said, Senator, back in Brooklyn, where I come from, we have the words for the, to serve the world's best and brightest. We call them Americans. But, but here is the two benefits that Alan Greenspan claimed that America would accrue by flooding America with H-1B visas, something that I'm sure Bob Goodlatte would be ecstatic about, by the way. So he says this, first skilled workers and their families form new households. They will of necessity move into vacant housing units. Don't you see the Norman Rockwell painting of the vacant housing unit? This is an American home lost to foreclosure. And he says this, the current glut of which, those vacant housing units, is depressing prices of American homes and of course, house price declines are a major factor in mortgage foreclosures and the plunge in value of the vast quantity of U.S. mortgage-backed securities that contributed substantially to the disabling of our banking system, when in reality, it was his subprime mortgages that did that. But then this is the one that infuriated me, and I think it infuriates everybody. The second so-called bonus, again, to flooding America with H-1B visas, would address the increasing concentration of income in this country. Someone's getting too much money, folks. Guess who it is? And it's, he's not talking about himself, by the way. And he says this, greatly expanding our quotas for the highly skilled would lower wage premiums of the skilled over the lesser skilled. Skill shortages in America exist because we're shielding our skilled labor force from world competition. Quotas have been substituted for the wage pricing mechanism, and in the process, we have created a privileged elite. Chuck, uh, um, where in the world have you ever heard American middle-class workers referred to as the privileged elite? And then he says, the privileged elite whose incomes are being supported at non-competitively high levels by immigration quotas on skilled professionals. Eliminating such restrictions would reduce at least some of our income inequality. So in other words, if we could flood America with tens of thousands of additional H-1B visas, perhaps from India or another third world country, where the workers have third world expectations of wages and working conditions, we could slash the middle class wages to reduce inequality between America's well-trained, highly educated middle class and America's working poor. In other words, we're not talking about a $15 an hour minimum wage, folks. They're talking about a $15 an hour standard wage. Where I come from, that's called communism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right on the money, Michael. Now, it's clearly, uh, it's communism, and that's There's what's at the heart what of the New said. World Order. Uh, hey, Dan, this is Chuck. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Michael brought up about uh, you know, flooding the United States and, you know, getting new passports is why does the United States let individuals have dual passports? If you're a U.S. citizen, you're a U.S. citizen. Why do you need dual passports? And one other thing I wanted to bring up is that uh, over the past year or so, I've been tracking uh, CBP's, uh, their, their request for proposals, RFPs, on hiring new agents. If you look at their process, it takes over a year for anybody to go through that process from initial application to all of the hoops and training and this and that, the background security checks, all the other stuff. And at the other end, one year later, only 30% come out and pass and can be hired. There has to be, you know, when we, we went back to CDP, uh, and, and told them the way you hire people will never work and so only Booz Allen and these other large corporations can even afford to go after these kind of contracts to provide these kind of individuals to CDP and so the entire federal government when they issue these contracts they're issuing them in a totally irrational way and not like what the civilian market will handle. And so there are numerous uh, issues, even at DHS, on how, how they hire and staff people at ICE and CBP. Well, you know, there's, there's one point I'll make about that, though. We've actually found that, we, that they have hired illegal aliens for the Border Patrol. 
So yeah. when you're giving people security clearances and giving them access to sensitive situations, you really want to be careful that you're not giving the keys to the kingdom, as it were, to somebody who shouldn't be there in the first place. So, in fact, I was disappointed when I hired on. They put me in a booth at Kennedy Airport with another inspector even before I had completed all of my training, which I thought was rushing the process because there was a shortage of people to man those booths. Um, we've got to be mindful who we provide um, information to and access to. So uh, I, I like to see things streamlined. But, you know, this is kind of like the way that people get very happy when the folks that do the uh, adjudications process for applications for political asylum and citizenship, and they say, well, we're going to get rid of the red tape and move those applications and clear up the backlog. Well, I can tell you, having been an adjudicator for a year, that it takes only minutes to approve an application. It can take days or longer to deny an application, because if you deny an application, let's say for asylum or citizenship or a green card, if you say no, then the alien, it must be presumed, will hire an attorney and will file an appeal and challenge that denial. So the denial has to be consist of a report with a bunch of, uh, of articulable facts to substantiate the ultimate decision, and then it's generally checked for legal sufficiency by an attorney, and that makes perfect sense. You have to do that because you will lose on appeal otherwise. But what happens then is if you're putting the pressure on to clear the backlog, what you really, really wind up doing is putting the pressure on the adjudicator to approve applications. So those DACA applications, and DACA never should have existed, by the way. Uh, the quick history of DACA, and again, I, I, ran, I, I ran this down for them today over at Fox earlier today. You had comprehensive immigration reform, which failed to pass. The globalists, primarily the Democrats, but with the assistance of some Republicans, concocted the DREAM Act to help the children. What escaped most people's attention is that the DREAM Act went to age 35. And if you wonder why 35, well, all that the alien had to do is claim, I came before I was 16, but I'm now 34 years of age, and I want to be able to stay here because I'm not, it's not my fault that I'm here. There's no way of verifying if that person came here 23 years ago or 23 days ago. So that bill got, got voted down, the DREAM Act was defeated. Along comes President Obama, 2012, standing in the, Oval, in the uh, Rose Garden and says, well, Congress failed to act, so I'm acting. Voting no is not a failure to act. Voting no is showing responsibility when the legislation is as terrible as that. And so he created DACA, Deferred Action Childhood Arrival, claiming he was using prosecutorial discretion. I wrote a piece where I said it was really prosecutorial deception. And now DACA could cover aliens as old as 38 years of age. That's not a child. This whole thing has been a scam. But in the process of processing the DACA application, which shouldn't have been done in the first place, do you know the approval rate, according to the material that I've most recently seen, ran to more than 95% approved? I can assure you that there was not a 95% approvable level of applications. But the push to get the paperwork through forces the adjudicator to make some bad decisions. And if they get an error, they get an error on the side of approving the application. Final point. I was called to testify in 2005. George W. Bush was given enough money to hire 800 new ICE agents and 2,000 more Border Patrol agents for that year and each of the next four years. I thought those were very low numbers. And then I came to find out that the president had cut the 800 new ICE agents down to 143. He cut 2,000 Border Patrol agents down to 210. So in preparing my testimony, I wanted to see what the witness for Citizenship and Immigration Services had to say. That's the division that processes the application. At the time, Eduardo Aguirre was the first director of Citizenship and Immigration Services. And he said that his three priorities, priority one was to get rid of the backlog of applications. Priority two was to enhance customer service. Priority three was to address national security. And I thought, my gosh, who in their right mind would make customer service a greater priority than national security? So I did a little bit of digging and found out that Mr. My, Michael, I, I hate to cut you short here, but we are working on a, a commercial break. Would you please pick that up on the other side of the break? I will, absolutely. 
Preserving the planet. The Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And today we have a really good program on at a perfect time to be having a discussion like this. And that is a discussion over border security and the international problem that we face, which is globalism, which is designed to destroy national borders worldwide and create a one-world socialist, Marxist, whatever you want to call it, system that uh, the borders are non-existent. And, uh, I, Michael, you were uh, just explaining to our yeah. listeners why uh, that the let's say the thinking behind this whole policy was so skewed and the priorities were in such disproportion. Would you uh, go ahead and finish with that? Sure. Yeah, just just to, to wrap that up. So the individual who was in charge of adjudicating the applications for various immigration benefits was a guy by the name of Eduardo Aguirre. And, and as I said just before the break, he, he indicated in his congressional testimony a week before I was to testify that his three priorities, priority one was to clear up the backlog. Well, we know that means rubber stamp the approvals as quickly as possible because that's the efficient, quick way to do it. Number two was improved customer service. And finally, number three was enhanced national security. And I was alarmed that he would make national security the final of those three priorities, not the first of those priorities. So I did a little bit of digging, and it turned out that before coming to the government, Mr. Aguirre had been the president of the private international bank of the Bank of America, the first bank to accept Mexican matricula cards against the best advice of the FBI who called those documents a threat to national security because they're not supported by any documentation that you could refer to. In other words, if you have a driver's license or a green card, there's a supporting file. You can review the file and say, okay, yeah, Mike Cutler got a green card. Here's the file. Here's the process. This is how we got it. The matricula cards had nothing backing them. They would simply issue the card and hand them out. And, in fact, Stephen McGraw had testified before the House Immigration Subcommittee. I believe it was in 03. And, again, I've been before that subcommittee as a witness, I think, eight or nine times myself. And he had said that they had actually found actual, not counterfeit, but actual matricula cards from Mexico in the possession of men from the Middle East who ran the U.S.-Mexican border. So the president of the private bank that accepted the matricula card is the guy that was then first appointed to run citizenship and immigration services. How insane is that? Well, and how insane is it the fact that uh, so many of uh, the people that are involved in our own government are actually uh, promoting systems that are totally antithetical to our constitutional republic. Chuck, you were going to uh, weigh in on that. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if, if you look at the Council of Affairs offices that Mexico has set up in the United States, there are over 60. And what Michael said is that they hand out these uh, cards like candy. You look at all of these uh, immigration groups from Casa de Maryland and all these immigration groups across the U.S., they get grants from Department of Labor, states, and all kinds of other things to uh, have job training seminars, to register voters for people to vote, and all those sort of things. And if you go back to what Michael was saying about DACA, President Trump has tried to do all he could against uh, DACA and other uh, people coming to the United States, and every time he does something, the liberals on the federal courts block him. And so, uh, you know, he has been trying, but you know, he needs more help in that area. So, one of the things that I have done l lately is, if, the pre if President Trump declares a national security emergency, I wrote some information that I sent to the White House that said if he does that, which I encourage him to do if he can't get a deal with the Democrats on the uh, getting the you know, getting the government back open, they have to have a total strategy on how he would do that. That has to include what's the military going to do. You have to have a good PR and media strategy. You have to have the talking points, the legislation. The most important 
you have to have a strategy against the federal court system from one of these liberal judges. And so, you know, if he does this, all this has to be in play and thought out strategically. And so, you know, I've written some information on this that I've given to the White House, and I think that they really have to take a look at this seriously and not just say, okay, we're going to declare a national emergency. Now what do we do? And so, I mean, I'd like to get Michael's input on this because, you know, I'd, I'd like to know even if he thinks that the president should do a national security emergency. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm happy to weigh in. I, I, I think it's a national security emergency. It's been for decades, you know, a, a big part of the drugs flowing into the United States flow across the Mexican border. Last year, more people died of drug overdoses than were killed by cars. I mean, so how this isn't the national emergency, and we also know that Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization sponsored, directed, uh, targeted by um, Iran, and you know what our situation with Iran is. In fact, it was just a major espionage case in Germany where Iran has been operating as well as the United States. Um, there have been hearings after hearings about how Hezbollah is operating with human traffickers and drug smuggling operations throughout Latin America to flood America with drugs for two purposes, to, to destroy our country and as a source of huge amounts of revenue, but also by moving people into the United States, they've taken the opportunity to move sleeper agents into the United States, and they have. So that border is a disaster. However, um, my concern is where the military goes working internally. I think that the president really needs to pull up the testimony from those hearings. There was just one hearing in April last year before the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Counterterrorism and Intelligence, chaired by Peter King. The witnesses were all in agreement, including the Democrat witness, that we have terrorist operations going on throughout Latin America. There are terror training camps in the tri-border region of Brazil. Two years ago, uh, an individual by the name of Arafat Ali Khan, or Sharafat Ali Khan, rather, a Pakistani national, was arrested prosecuted for smuggling men from the Middle East through Brazil into Latin America, ultimately up into the United States. The fact that he was in Brazil is disconcerting. Think of the tri-border region. At least one of the men that he smuggled in has a known connection to the Taliban. So we know what's going on. The problem is I don't think the president has done a good enough job discussing that with the American people. When he sat in the Oval Office and finally spoke to the American people, something that I thought he should have done initially with the so-called travel ban, which was never a travel ban, by the way. It was an entry restriction, which is a very different idea than a travel ban. And it wasn't done by executive order. He simply issued a proclamation which triggered Title VIII United States Code Section 1182F that says that the president has wide latitude to deny any alien or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants entry to the United States if he determines that their presence is detrimental to the interests of the United States. I can't imagine a lower bar than detrimental to the interests. That law has been on the books since 1952. It was invoked by President Carter when the Iranians overran our embassy in Tehran. It was invoked by George W. Bush and by Barack Obama. So the president needs to understand the impact that words have. You know, it's interesting, but my, my degree was in communications, arts, and sciences. The issue is language. That's why when I hear politically correct nonsense, I go crazy. There's nothing politically correct about any of this. This is all Orwellian. This is about altering the public understanding of critical issues through the use of artful language. And that's something that the president really needs to work on getting a clear message out about. That we're not being politically correct, that the other side is using propaganda and Orwellian newspeak to make an honest conversation impossible. And, and really and truly, I think the biggest issue that we are ignoring is interior enforcement, going after the fraud, working on task forces. You know, we're told that if immigration authorities work with the police, then victims of crimes won't come forward. That's a total lie and no one ever pushes back. Mm -hmm. In point of fact, we can give visas to aliens who are here illegally if they provide us with actionable intelligence that leads to the prosecution of drug traffickers, criminals, terrorist organizations. That was one of my responsibilities when I was assigned to DEA intelligence and then again when I was with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. 
the immigration laws give us tremendous tools that we can use to get the cooperation of members of the ethnic immigrant community. This isn't just about Latin America. Human nature is human nature. Every culture, every race, every religion has the good, the bad, and the ugly. This isn't about Mexicans. It's not about any one nationality. It's one distinction. You're either an American citizen or you're not. And if you're not a citizen, you're an alien, mm -hmm. period. We need clarity in the language so that the public gets a true understanding of how serious this crisis is and the fact that there are remedies that if and only if Congress would stop playing politics with national security in American lives. That, that, that is very true. Absolutely, and, and uh, one thing that, uh, Michael, that you mentioned, and I think this is important, is that I believe the president needs to do more, uh, you know, Oval Office uh, talks before the American people. You know, yep. uh, the old fire, fireside chat that, uh, that uh, Franklin yep. Roosevelt used. I think at, at yep. this point, we have so much so much fake news out there trying to destroy the president. His best bet is to uh, become uh, come before the American people and talk very earnestly and very openly about the issues that are confronting America. It's the public relations and the way that the things are presented to the American public has to get better because you know when, when I talk to a lot of people about the wall, they don't understand what is a wall. Uh, they go, uh, well, we don't want a wall on our southern border, but you, know, you talk to them about layer security and all the other things that have to be done, they go, oh, I get it now. You know, one of the things that Michael talks about is Iran. Well, if you go back and look at what President Obama did in giving billions of dollars of cash to the Iranians, where do you think that money has gone? It's gone to Syria, it's gone to these individuals who are are getting people into Central and South America to come into the U.S., they're using that money against us. And, you know, there's a, a certain department at Department of Treasury that does nothing but track money worldwide. This, 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 President Obama gave them cash so that this particular group at the Treasury Department could not track the money that he gave to Iran for illicit uh, things that they're going to be doing. So. To me, that was one of the most treasonous things that anybody's ever done to the United States is giving money and all that cash, plain loads of class, cash to Iran. By the way, I have to amplify one point you made, Chuck, and you're right. Venezuela, according to the president of Guatemala, and the president of Guatemala himself said that his people had arrested and deported nearly 100 members of ISIS. And he also said that the president of Venezuela had given money to the caravan, and there's another caravan starting up, by the way. Venezuela is strapped for cash. They don't have three nickels to rub together. I assure you that the money came from Iran, because if you look at the history, within the last decade, there have been routine flights directly from Tehran to Caracas, Venezuela, of, of uh, Iranian shock troops, the Quds forces. I can assure you that some of that money has made its way to Venezuela, and now Venezuela is stirring the pot in Latin America against the United States. So I, I believe that what you said is exactly on target. Yeah, I, you know, I, I fully know that because I have a lot of people in the intel area that you know, kind of tell me, you know, off the side, you know, what's, what's happening around the world. And if you track international news and whatever, you can also figure it out by yourself. And I think that we, uh, as Americans and maybe myself or some others, we need to, to uh, organize a march in Washington, D.C. to support the president and to support uh, immigration reform and total border security. And so I'm going to be looking at that as far as uh, getting a permit from the uh, from Washington, D.C. in order to put something like that together. And I think that the, the liberals, the Democrats, the globalists would be very shocked at the number of Americans who have come in and support President Trump on what he's trying to do. You know, uh, Chuck, that's a great segue because we are uh, running uh, running out of time. I want to talk about what you gentlemen see as the best solutions to 
creating border security and supporting the president. You mentioned this uh, March on Washington. Uh, I'd like to uh, have both of you gentlemen weigh in on what we can do to support the president and best ways that the American people can be involved. Well, you know, I, I think that w one of the things, uh, just to be quick about this, the American people, number one, should be reaching out to the news media and tell them that we're not going to be paying attention to their, their broadcasts, buying their newspapers or their magazines. They're looking for revenue. Let them come to understand that we're going to choke them by not turning the channel to their programming until and unless they start to broadcast the truth. We really need to go after the media. They're very important. That so-called fifth estate, uh, you know, we know that a democratic republic can't survive without an informed electorate. So they need to feel heat. The politicians need, need to feel heat also. Um, and, you know, by the way, I just want to quickly put this out there. I hope everybody will go read my articles at Front Page Magazine, frontpagemag.com, and the social contract. Because the whole idea is to get the information that the media is refusing to transmit to the American people. We need to start what I call the busted brigade of truth, because right now, most of what you're getting from the news are lies and propaganda. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and I, I think American citizens should write letters to their local newspapers, go on radio shows like we are, uh, talk to their neighbors, uh, call their politicians, uh, send uh, donations to organizations that will do something with it, not just waste it. So there's a lot of things that the average American citizen can do, but it's got to be one step at a time. And you can use social media and a lot of the other electronic tools that we have today. But most important, call the White House and tell them you support them. Maybe the White House will put up on their website, you know, uh, uh, where they, they say, do you want to build a wall and have layered security to you support us? And they will get not only 100,000, they will get millions of people that would sign up for that. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, one thing I think that's going to be really important, and I'm sure you gentlemen will agree with this, is that Americans uh, start calling a spade a spade, start calling um, people who are committing treason, uh, congressmen and senators who are acting against the best interests of the United States, uh, call them what they are and quit pussyfooting around about uh, what treason really is. Absolutely. They need to take the oath of office seriously, and people in California and New York and other places that have these sanctuary cities and counties and states and whatever, they need to rebel. They need to say, hey, you know, why am I sending you my tax dollar and letting you waste it on letting criminals out on the street and destroying our neighborhood. So there's a lot of things that an individual can do, but again, we need to have a national movement to show the public and the elected politicians, especially in Washington, that they're behind the president 100%. Well, um, I'd, I'd like to use the last few minutes of our radio program. Uh, Michael, I'd like you to uh, take this opportunity to talk about your radio program that you do and some of the projects okay. you're involved, and then we'll give the last few minutes to Chuck to talk about the programs that he's working on. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And, Chuck, thank you for making my appearance on the program today possible. Um, my own personal website is Michael Cutler, C U T L E R, MichaelCutler.net. I write for Front Page Magazine, sponsored by the David Horowitz Freedom Center. The website is FrontPageMag.com. I also write for the Social Contract. My latest article for them, that's the quarterly of the Social Contract, was um, Sanctuary Country Immigration Failures by Design. Uh, I mean, let's be very honest. We haven't had real immigration enforcement in this country for decades, and we're now suffering the results of that. And on Friday evenings for one hour, 7 o'clock East Coast time, the Michael Cutler Hour on Blog Talk Radio, ever since the ashes from 9-11 landed on my home and my neighbors died, uh, I made it my decision that I was going to go out there and try to provide the inside uh, perspective on immigration, border security, 
and how it impacts America and Americans. And a final thought, I always like to say democracy is not a spectator sport. And I know we have a republic, but my conservative friends get nuts when they say that. But we do need to be involved. And the politicians who are not backing the president are really not backing Americans. The president was elected on the promise that he would secure the borders. If this was truly a democratic process, his opponents would understand that they lost the election. They would say, okay, in every era, in every defeat, there's a lesson. They know the lesson. They don't want to learn the lesson. By not wanting to do what the president wants, they're also being insubordinate to we the people, and they need to be made to pay a political price for that insubordination. Amen. Uh, Chuck, uh, go ahead and talk about uh, some of the things you're working on and how people can contact you. Okay. Uh, I've been uh, writing a lot of articles uh, to the White House and the NSC staff and other critical uh, Trump uh, members of the administration on what needs to be done uh, to secure the border, uh, have total immigration reform, what's best for the country. And one of the things that I have not seen in the past two years from the Trump administration, which I would like to see going forward, is that he has not put in the thousands of political appointees that he's authorized to have. Right now, from my count, uh, he, he can put in at least 3,000 more political appointees at the PAS and the Schedule C level and he needs these people because the administration that he now has at the top level with just the PAS uh, executives that he has, uh, the secretaries, deputies, etc., that's not enough to combat the Obama people and the liberals in the federal government. He has to have all 4,000 political appointees throughout the federal government to make sure that his agenda is followed, his mission is at foremost in everybody's mind because at DHS and all these other agencies, there are so many people that are buried into the bureaucracy that don't agree with his agenda and are fighting him every day. And you need political appointees in these organizations in order to make sure that the president's mission, goals are followed. And so. That's one of the things that I would encourage everybody to call the White House and say, put the political appointees in in order to help the president because he cannot do it by himself. He's been trying to. And, you know, you look at Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell the last two years, they haven't supported him 100%, especially on border security. I'd like to see that change. Yeah, I would too. Uh, the, the, the deep state in Washington, D.C. is extremely deep, and the swamp is still filled full of very treacherous creatures. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is the president cannot do this by himself. As you say, he needs our help, and it's important that Americans start standing up and being counted. You can't be quiet any longer. Don't worry about uh, being uh, perceived as someone who is a rabble-rouser. Take pride in being a rabble-rouser. Take pride in being a patriot. Uh, both of you gentlemen are uh, really terrific examples of that. Michael, I'm sure glad that I had the opportunity to uh, uh, hear your point of view. I look forward to uh, staying in communication with you and doing Absolutely. radio programs as well. Absolutely. No, I thank you. And I thank you for the work you're doing. As I say, we, we need to create a bucket brigade of truth where, where the people get to find out what really is going on. Yeah, you're, you're right on the money. Well, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, I thank our listeners for joining us to connect a few more dots. And let's continue this program next week with some new information on connecting the dots. And again, uh, gentlemen, thank you for all you do for our country and the important information that you uh, brought to our listeners today. Thank you.